So it looks like. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Quantum Mechanics with Jen Sharp. <clears throat> We've gotten to the point of the breakdown of the central uh, hive-minded grand unified field theory. Excellent progress. I am happy. I do. I do want to be optimistic. Don't want to be overly optimistic. So let's have a look at. Compared to that article, which is a good start, what's actually going on? How can we understand it in a way that makes sense, is organic, in terms of concepts where, you know, so as long as we already have an idea of position and time, simultaneously those are the easiest and the hardest ones because they work on the very fundamental level, which is hard to discern, it's hard to visualize. But then we experience time all the time and space all the time, so it should have some intuitive aspect. The other two are momentum and energy. Those have to do with how much potential there is in the system to do work. That's the total energy. And momentum has more to do with a pressure or force that a system can exert. I want to explain the results of the double slit experiment in terms of something that while the Copenhagen interpretation isn't wrong, it, it is correct for a waveform. It's just that not everything is a waveform. And now we've kind of stumbled onto this lunar, this lunar question, does the moon exist if we, if we aren't observing it? Well, obviously it is at all times, so it's a bit of a, the ideology that allowed for that idea to take root in the first place was somehow stunted. It's a completely illogical premise. Single emitter. Now that's hard to do. We try we have to get it down to one single electron at a time. So therefore we're minimizing its wave-like properties just by sending one single one out at a time. It comes out. If there was just a normal screen and there was nothing. So we can think of this as a kind of a trivial solution to the wave equation. There's no interference slit, nothing happening really to this electron before it gets to the screen. So the landing spot where it's observed on the screen is always the same place. So that's the energetic minimum. And that means that the amount of energy it takes to get to this point is smaller than any other amount of energy. So let's say an alternative path would mean you traveled longer, so it would be more energy to take that longer path. Therefore, it wouldn't get taken from an entropy perspective. The system always goes with the highest entropy configuration. And that's what they've missed all these years, kind of inventing pseudoparticles with the exception of the neutron, which decays to a proton, and there's an energetic reason for that. A bounded neutron is more or less, has an infinite lifetime, bounded within an, an atomic nucleus. Neutron, electron, proton, those are all good to go in terms of an infinite lifetime. The other ones have finite lifetimes, so we can always correlate that back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which has that energetic component. Finite time, finite energy, that doesn't necessarily mean we're dealing with a particle. So if we want to have an understanding of what's happening when there's a slit, what we have to understand what a slit actually does to a system. We, have, we can start with the exact same electron, single electron going at a time, and then a very teeny tiny slit. So that slit isn't an arbitrary size, it has to be small enough so that we can converge on what are called the uncertainty properties of every waveform. Now, unfortunately, there is a bit of math to understand, but the good news is that if you can understand a single canonical conjugation relation and how that maps out on a graph, it's usually easy to take that and then apply it to other things. As long as you can understand what that fundamental side of it is, we can start with this because it's easy to see what delta x is. This equation is delta x times delta px is greater than h. 
So the product of two things is larger than a number, which is a constant number. So this number doesn't change. The product is always greater than that value. So if we take delta x to what's called the small limit, it's going to be very small, which is what a slit is. Very small passage, small distance. This is going to be very small, therefore this has to get larger to maintain this as true. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's the uncertainty relation at the heart of all particle interactions, at a very fundamental level. So we have to imagine a slightly more complicated scenario when we're dealing with the slit. The electron waveform comes, something happens at the slit, and then we have a non-trivial pattern occurring on the screen, which probably looks something along. It really depends on this, and if you have a second slit, it will give a slightly different pattern. There's still going to be interference, it's just going to add up, the vectors are going to add up differently, basically. This is an energetic entity, it has a mass energy, that's all it really has. It's traveling. And it's going to come to this very tiny, tiny hole. And before it reaches that hole, the direction of its momentum function is forward. It has all potential momentum. Overall, the momentum has to be in a forward direction because there's something that's pressing it in this direction towards the screen. Before it reaches the slit, it has all possible momenta. When it actually gets to the slit, one of those momenta is chosen by the slit. It's called the act of observation on a quantum mechanical level. The variable goes from being unobserved to observed. Now, it's a two-step process when you add that slit because the momentum is observed here, but the energy is observed here. So what we're noting at the screen is a distorted electron function. Yeah, you can come through this hole, but you have to pick what momentum you're going at. No offense, you're just too big to fit through with all your, your potential momenta, so we have to reduce it down to one. And you can think of that as the act of observation of that electron's waveform energy. Did it fully collapse? It did fully collapse once it reached this screen. So that's when its energy fully materialized. We could measure it and say, yeah, there's an electron there. Until that point, it was partially collapsed. So we have to get used to thinking of waveforms as things that aren't either 100% projected or 100% collapsed. There's a very clear pathway within that where information is taken at every step from the waveform. Here it's simple, it can't really get more simple than this because it's one electron and it only has those two potential coordinates, the position and the momentum. When we go into higher dimensions, we really have to understand at a deep, deep level that each interaction a quantum system goes through changes it if it interferes with it. That interference, that instant, is the observation. We can't distinguish between those two things Otherwise, we run the risk of extrapolating our knowledge bases past the point of what's called the measurement limit, and that's simply going to cause reality to become distorted either in a convergent way, which I've already explained with, I hate to bring it up again, Marxism. So this is the whole idea. Now, you can see in the article that it's two, two explanations much worse than this one because they're kind of not, neither of them's kind of right. A system will be quantum mechanical, will exhibit quantum mechanical properties if its state variables are in potential, so gases, plasma, liquid, these will all have some degree of quantum mechanical, you can think of it as a deformation, that the momentum of that electron was deformable. Same with the position of the liquid. It's deformable depending on its container. When we go from the manifest into the unmanifest, we're not talking about a single dimensional leap necessarily. The dimensions are energetic, so how many, however many 
energetic dimensions can exist. That's the cardinality of your system. So from this very basic starting point of quantum mechanics, we can start to build up higher dimensional modeling that's going to be fun to see how long it takes someone to copy that idea and try to pass it off as their own. I'm sure in the end, it'll all work out.